Ready? Mm. I'm ready now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'll say this. I'm very excited to have this conversation with you. Um, when the idea initially came for me to host a speaker series or documentary with um, LGBT <laughs> folks, especially black gay men, um, about the experiences at work or um, their family or growing up, I questioned its validity. I questioned whether it was needed. I mean, we have polls on television. We have Ryan Murphy at Netflix. And there are so many. We had a gay person running for president, right? But then I think at the beginning of this year, I came across a video that went viral, a young boy, couldn't be no more than 13 years old, and that he had attempted to come out to his parents, and then they had punished him, did something with his hair. Very traumatic experience. He was very young. So I, I realized, okay, there's a need for more conversation. There's a need for more discussions to be had. There's a need for more education. So I want to begin with you by asking you, how old were you when you came out to your parents and family? Uh, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I think, you know, all through grade school and middle school, you were called all kinds of names, sissy and fag and all the things that we, we don't like and we, we object to. Um, I didn't know that meant that I was a different sexuality or attracted to men. Um, and I, and it, one of the things that happened in high school is that I went to a, an all boy Jesuit private, mostly white high school. And in my senior year, um, the school hired a counselor who was a gay black man, which was like the first time I'd ever sort of seen someone who was out. So he and I bonded and we had lots of good conversations. I still didn't know I was gay then. I didn't really realize I was gay until I went to college. Um, I don't know how and why. I actually had never had any experiences, um, but it just felt right when I first said the words to myself. It was like, yeah, that makes sense. And when I came out to my family, it was interesting. My, my grandmother had an interesting reaction. My mom, who I loved dearly, told me that she and everyone else knew and what took me so long. Uh, so it was great to have everyone embrace embrace that. And it's not, it's not been a problem in, in my family um, at all. And uh, I live very openly. Um, my life is my life. And uh, being a gay black man is something I'm extremely proud of. Uh, I think it brings a lot of interest in my life. And, and, and the uniqueness that I have, I think, makes me who I am. I was 25 years old when I came out. Came out to my mom and my brother first um, before kind of doing it more publicly um, in 2016 um, after I got to Boston to start law school and, and then finally kind of made a change my Facebook relationship status to in a relationship with Derek and that was kind of the way that I came out publicly which was a very transformative moment summer of 2016. And I was 16 when I came out. Um, I like to often say I didn't necessarily come out, but I was brought out. Um, my dad actually sat me down um, and said that he has noticed some strange things, um, some people I was hanging with and so forth. And so he just asked me, what's that about? Um, and I wasn't completely honest because I don't feel like I was ready, honestly. And um, he had asked, I think during the time it was either MySpace or the beginning of Facebook. Uh, and he was just like, uh, let me see your Facebook. And I was just like, no. Uh, and so he, I went upstairs, I called my mom, just like, Dad's trying to go through my social media. And um, she had talked to him, settled him down, and then got off the phone, and she, and he said, well, I still want to see. Um, and so I just told him, I was just like, I, I like men. And he started speaking about religion and God. Um, and that was, pretty much it. Um, you know, we didn't talk around the house for a few weeks. It was really awkward. Uh, and since then, it's been about um, 12 years. And unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago. So I don't necessarily feel like we had the opportunity to fully mend our relationship because um, it was still a little rocky. Um, but my mom, um, she took it better. And we have a great relationship now. Uh, she loves my partner, my husband, Jonathan, and so that's really great. Um, and my sister um, is also wonderful. So um, I definitely have a supportive family now, um, a happy family, and uh, um, I'm happy about it. 
The coming out experience remains a very daunting moment for many LGBTQ people, especially young people, because we still live in a country and a world that creates policies that are hostile to them. It is critical that we celebrate this community and tell these stories because we have had to jump through so many hoops and our freedom to exist and to love is always at stake. So I came out um, when I was, I think, 19, or going on 20. Um, so I came out in college. Mm -hmm. um, I went to Yale undergrad, and um, they have a term called sophomore surprise. Um, so in your uh, freshman year, people are like, mm, we think you're probably gay, but you haven't come out, you're not. But then, you know, sophomore year, you come out. And it's a surprise, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but not really. Uh, so it was New Year's 2008, um, uh, and I, I was, uh, yeah, I was, I was, or 2000, yeah, I was transitioning to 2000, uh, 2008, and um, I told my parents that. That day. But I had to, I had kind of started the process before, so I told mm -hmm. like my sister first right uh, and then uh, my best friend and then actually uh, the girlfriends I had in high school because I was gotcha. like I wanted them to you know hear about it from somebody else and you know have people say stuff to them or anything like that mm -hmm. so um, so yeah so I, I did that first um, and, then, and then it was kind of the moment where I was like okay I'm gonna tell my parents because in college I felt like there was a weight on me there was something you know it was just taking up a lot of my energy to like uh, to hide it and to gotcha. you know to figure out um, so it was and I was like I don't want to carry this weight out around anymore um, and you know it was something my dad had said the night before we, we went out for New Year's uh, and he was like you know you know wishing me you know for the best for me and uh, you know was like oh I hope you know you get a girl you know a girlfriend and I was like okay we need to right, <laughs> we need we you need to be to wishing you for the right things <laughs> right right uh, so yeah so then we had that conversation New Year's uh, how did they react to it did they take it well were they embracing supportive so um, you know my parents are pretty practical they are so my uh, you know my parents are Haitian um, they uh, they both came here from Haiti both of them are doctors uh, so I think you know they probably had gay patients before and uh, knew gay people in their lives mm -hmm. um, it was but it's different when it's your son when it's your family uh, so, you know, I think initially uh, there was shock. It was not, you know, it wasn't like a great day. Um, and, you know, we kind of had to go through the process because, you know, I, I you know, started to attend groups in, in school. You know, I, there was a group called PRISM mm. uh, that we restarted with my friend Alex. And she was like, you know, it was for queer people of color. Gotcha. Uh, and so we restarted that and started having conversations. And, you know, somebody was saying, you know, and we were thinking, you know, you know, people are saying, how do we contend with love when it can be used to hurt you mm -hmm. in such a way, you know, for people you care about the most? Um, and somebody kind of brought up the point that it took you this long, you know, it took, you know, it took you time to figure out that you were this way. Uh, not that you didn't know, but, you know, to kind of it come to yourself. It took you some time to understand it, to come yeah. to terms with it. Yeah. And so they're going to need that time, too, because they already had an image. They understood certain things about you. And mm -hmm. they need that time to transition as well. And it wasn't a thing, too, where some people were like, you know, I had friends when I, you know, came to Boston after college where they were like, yeah, I told my parents they had to, like, get okay with it, you know, it, within this time period or, you know, I'm out. And I was like, that's not quite how it's going to work right, for right. me, you know, given who, my parents, you know, who, you know, the, the, what the things they've done for me, uh, that I know that they love me, right? Correct. And I know that... Um, that they want the best for me and it was you know fear about like people how people will think of you and what uh you know what options you might be limiting yourself from mm -hmm. if you know if you choose to do this right Correct. and choose yeah. to live uh this life so i think that was the thing uh that they were contending with i mean my mom was just here this past weekend you know helping me move into my new place so you know it's uh and you know i think we're getting to a place it's more of a cross the bridge when we get there type of thing so they've met uh you know a past boyfriend of mine and they you know it's just it's you know it's kind of uh, you know, piece by piece, and I think yeah. it's... Yeah, that uh, is really interesting. I think people have asked me, 
why is this a discussion? Why is this a conversation? And I'm like, well, I wish it wasn't. <laughs> and, I, and I'm thinking, it, it, this can only, we can only wake up in a world where we don't have to come out of it if everybody is educated mm. enough, if everybody is loving enough, embracing enough, and also open to the diverse way folks come into this world, you know, how they express themselves, the gender pronouns that they use, and not the, how, the, how they use clothes to present themselves. And I think it can only happen. I think representation is also one of the main pieces mm -hmm. that's going to sort of like open up space for people to see, oh, this is exactly who I am and I don't have to make an announcement about it. And so what are your thoughts around institution ensuring that there is representation, not just on a racial, but also on a gender and also on a sexuality level and how people identify themselves? So I think a couple of things. Um, one of the, the things you had mentioned is like, okay, uh, you know, representation is important. I do think there's like two things, mindset, like the mindset of folks, education. Um, it means we have to kind of come to terms with who we are as people. It, we, we set ourselves up in a way that um, we have, um, you know, I would say biological impulses to say, okay, this is a new thing. Let me examine it. Let me think about it. Or, you know, might push it away and say, that's us versus them. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, the people who are different from you are people and they have emotions, feelings, maybe different types of feelings than you do. Um, you know, they, they have sexual feelings. They might not have sexual feelings, whatever. Um, and so uh, there's a spectrum. And I think, you know, thinking about things in a spectrum is that, you know, you might fit on one part of that spectrum, another person fits on that other part of the spectrum. And uh, all those things, I, I think, are valid. And we have to be okay. I think the, the mindset change that needs to happen is being celebrating difference. Correct. Right? It's, yeah. it's saying, expecting it and going, oh, okay, that's, we're going to be different. It, and when you see it, it embracing yes, it. Yes. As a, because I understand that we have, and I'm, you know, like that too. I'm like seeing people and I'm like, mm, you're not a good person for me. Or, <laughs> you know, like, you know, because I, I see things that I've seen before that aren't good for me or like, mm -hmm. you know, and you can, and I don't think that's something people have to give up. I'm just saying that it, we have brains for a reason and we can say, this is how I'm approaching the situation. Let me approach it differently. Right. Or let me, let me uh, take it a step further. So that's one. And then on the representation side, I think people, when you think about celebrating difference, it's not about having, you know, one token gay person, one token black person. Like, the, we think differently as a group, too, right? Even though we, like, want our rights and we want these things. But even within our group, there's so much diversity. There is diversity within our group, yes. So you need people who have gen different gender pronouns, people who come from different um, walks of life and come from different life experience and multiple people so that yes. you can get as much of a range of opinion that you're not going to have all of it in your company or whatever else, but having one person on your council isn't enough because I remember somebody saying something like if there were, you know, if there was, you know, a black person on the board, they wouldn't have done this. And I'm like, maybe that, you know, <laughs> that could have still happened, could have yeah. still happened um, because that person might have not been offended or not, you know, not seen it or d didn't have the history or understanding about that situation. Yes, I agree. And when you have multiple people, um, women, you know, men, tr transgender folks, whoever in your, you know, uh, non-binary folks, it, when you have more than one, it's better, you know, again, but I think it has to be an array. You can't just say, oh, I've, I've done it. I have, you know, a black person on my board or I have, you know, uh, you know, a gay person, aren't I doing great, you know? Um, so I think that will help with representation. I think that's going to, that will help, dis, you know, make companies make better decisions. I think you'll get a broader view and then it will also show, demonstrate that it's like, oh, these people are different on a spectrum, even though they're gay or even though they're this, there's an array of folks and how, you know, how they express themselves and do things. That's yes, important. totally, totally agree. I think institutions should take that on and understanding that the, the more diversity they have in voices and opinions and abilities, right? Um, there's a lot of ism that they, they're trying to fight, but then that can also contribute to the better and the improvement of those organizations. Just this morning, I was reading news around 
teachers right here in the United mm -hmm. States who had pride flags in their class, and they've one of them have been fired. Mm -hmm. Another one, have, they've asked him to cover the pride flag in, inside of the class. You know, all over the world, LGBT folks are discriminated against politically, systematically, and you know, historically, mm -hmm. we've been discriminated against. And the work I'm thinking of the work that GLAD does, right, as a defender agency or as an advocacy agency. You've recently joined the board of directors. What does that mean for you, and how do you see the impact on the community? So GLAD is an organization I've been following for a long time. So when I was in high school uh, and, you know, kind of coming to terms with myself, you know, seeing them fight for gay people was something that really inspired me. And then I think it was uh, in 2003 where they won the uh, gay marriage decision here in Massachusetts. And I was following that very closely. I was also into law. I was also into, you know, politics in general um, and thought, yeah, I was going to be a political science major and do all these things things, but seeing that uh, and seeing that, um, you know, somebody was fighting for me mm -hmm. without knowing me, right, it, it, you know, gave me like little wins, you know, those were those things that would like, you know, kind of propel me for it to be like, okay, the world is changing, it's mm -hmm. getting better, um, and, you know, even though marriage may not have been, you know, the fight everybody wanted to have, but there's, you know, rights that come along with it. It's kind of a chicken and the egg type thing. When people say that's illegal, right? When it was just illegal to mm -hmm. just be gay, right? When it's not illegal anymore, it's like, oh, it, it, it's not illegal, right? Like people think about things differently. Correct. The law influences Correct. how people think, and then we also influence how law is made, right? Right. So if something's not illegal anymore, it's like, oh, it's fine for them to do that. So why are you, you know, like people can, uh, you know, sometimes people will mind their own business and they'll say, whatever, you're doing something that's legal, leave it alone. But when not you're not, by, yeah, yeah. when you're not, it's a little different of a story. It's like, um, it, there's the stigma piece again. And so GLAD's work is about fighting uh, discrimination and, uh, you know, and including, uh, and I think they're also, um, the, the thing that I've been enjoying about being on the board since joining is that there's a, a bigger view than it's just about gay people, right? Mm -hmm. That we have to be part of other fights because those are our fights too. Yeah, so I am the, the first person of color to lead Mass Cultural Council, which is an organization that's been around for a while that really supports arts and culture and science and humanities in the state. And so having this gig as the first person of color came with a lot of weight and importance and um, uh, frankly anxiety because I want to make sure I'm doing a good job. But it's been about six months and I feel comfortable in the seat and I feel like I bring a perspective that maybe has not been heard or seen in the state. So I'm going to give it my all. Sure, so we have been conducting a number of community check-ins uh, since I came on board, somewhat to introduce me to the state because I am new to the state. I moved here two summers ago from the Washington, D.C. area. And these check-ins are a great, great way for me to hear from the community, hear what they need. Uh, certainly the check-ins that we did this year were, were mostly related to COVID-19 and the crisis that we've been suffering with the shutdown. But also, um, there are a lot of people out there that need help with um, the racial reckoning that the country has been going through, advice on how to uh, diversify their organizations, how to create action plans on looking at being more equitable, um, and just wanting more support in general. So it was twofold. It was, a, it was a chance for me to hear from the community so I can start envisioning what I want to do with the council, but also uh, a chance for them to hear from me and get to know me. I think that unconditional love really has to mean unconditional. And I think that we in this world like to say love, but with conditions. Um, and so when I became a dad, and um, I, I'm so lucky that I, I adopted a, a beautiful baby from Vietnam when he was eight months old, and he's now 20 years old now. But being able to raise him as an openly gay man who was proud of his heritage and proud of his sexuality, I think helped him sort of get grounded in life and know that the things that make him who he is are very good. You know, he was, a, he was a, an Asian adopted kid to a black man and a white man. And so his life was, in many ways, like I jokingly say, it was like a Benetton ad where he 
you get to feel the colors. Um, but throughout his life, we told him that his life is his life and that and that's something to be proud of. Um, so I, I just think he, one, he teaches me every day because he lives on this planet um, with so much joy and warmth and kindness uh, and openness. The friendships that he has are, are really strong and it's taught me to cherish my friendships. It's also taught me to live life grateful for what I have and not wanting the things I don't have. Um, and all of that comes from the love that my family shows. Even now, we we have this fantastic, funny, sometimes crude, but always out of love text exchange that happens every day. And it's just a joy. How do you think the arts play a role in educating the public and educating people about certain issues? The arts are intrinsic in all parts of culture. I, I believe that the arts, one, um, helps the world to progress. Um, the thing I love about artists and creative creatives out there is that we are professionals at seeing the world differently. Um, I, I could sort of call it a professional imaginators. Like our job is to open up a computer and a Word document and all of a sudden see a play or a movie script there or a book there um, or see a blank canvas and imagine what can go on the canvas and then put it there. So I do believe that um, imagination is seeing the world differently. Imagination is seeing the world differently. Creativity is bringing imagination to life and art is the product of creativity and artists are the vehicle through it. And so one of the ways I think that arts um, play an intrinsic role in society is that artists have a way of reflecting what is happening in society, but also to see some, some, some solutions for solving the problems of society. And I think about when um, communities were built way back when, in the center of the community in Town Square was the State House, the church, and then some sort of performing arts entity. And all the conversations about what needed to happen in the world happened in that town square. And it was the artists that helped us to think about what the world could be in the future. And so I think that art is intrinsic and I believe that that's why we have to support it. That's why we have to embrace it. We have to make sure that it exists in our community, um, either in the, the dance company that's next door or the murals that are in the middle of town square. Um, and, and, that, and it also makes the state and the people and the communities that we're in more competitive and more vibrant because the more people get exposed to art, the more their minds are expanded to the creative process. And that's what you want in every single form of business and community and health and human services. Your first artistic performance, I understand, was when you were very young. How old were you when you did your first performance and how did you realize that the art was going to be your conduit into the world? Uh, sure. So my first, uh, my first performance uh, that I remember, at least I should say, I'm sure there may have been some concerts and Christmas concerts and things like that here and there. But the first one I remember is when I played Hansel in the third act of Hansel and Gretel. There were three Hansels. My mom says I was the best Hansel and she has no biases whatsoever. Uh, but I remember in, I don't remember much about it, but I do remember at one point in act three, while the witch had me in a cage, I said something and the whole audience erupted in laughter. And that response was so visceral. I remember just something clicking in me and I just wanted to recreate that sensation again and again and again, just to sort of be able to be up on stage or be in a room or in front of people and, and elicit some sort of emotional response, either a laugh or tears or frustration. And it just stuck with me the whole time. And so I, I, I kept doing theater through grade school and I also picked up dance and music and singing and trumpet playing. Uh, did that through middle school and high school and actually eventually went to college to study trumpet and music. Um, and then that just was the thing that, it, you know, I think of it as a calling. The arts are a calling. You sort of find, it, it doesn't find you, you find, I mean, sorry, it, it, it finds you, you don't find it. it it's a vocation. And so uh, it's just a thing I have been doing all my life and I enjoy it so much.
Oh my goodness, so it's a funny story. Uh, it was the end of my freshman year and the end of Jonathan's junior year. Yeah. Uh, and we're both involved in campus organizations, mostly student government. Um, and so I'm more of a behind the scenes person. I was running a young ladies campaign and Jonathan was running for student body president. And um, of course with campaigns, a lot of different rules and so forth. So um, after the showcase, um, there was a rule that you couldn't have anything, any paraphernalia on campus after um, 8 p.m. And so I had saw something was on his car from the parade and I didn't know him at the time. And so I just approached him, I'm like, hey, you may wanna get that on your car. So approaching the deadline, you can get disqualified. So, of course, he knew that um, some of his team members just didn't get the stuff off the car. Uh, and so I shared, I can go to my dorm, it's right there, I can get it for you. And um, they handled it, and we exchanged numbers and were talking throughout the night. At the time, I didn't necessarily knew, uh, know he liked men, um, so I could tell through the text messages that he was kind of interested in me a bit. Uh, and honestly, we just kicked it off from there, from that day on to the next day. We were talking 24-7, and it is nine years later, um, and we're here. So 15% of Boston's youth identify as members of the LGBT community, and both of you lead an organization that tackles higher education. And we know that there is extreme discrimination for people that identify as LGBT and people of color in accessing you know, resources such as education. And I want you to talk about how does the leadership brainery came about and how does it directly tackle, you know, the issues, whether that's discrimination or access for those groups. Yeah, no, I think that's a great question. Um, first, how leadership brainery came about. Um, so it was definitely through our own personal experiences. And when I came to Tufts, I was the only black man to enter my cohort that year. And then Jonathan went to Boston University School of Law, was one out of four black men. Uh, and then I went to BU Law as well, and I was one out of two. Um, I didn't finish my time. In the context, one out of four out of 250 students coming into my class, and about 140-ish, uh, 240-ish coming into theirs class. I think that's significant. It is significant. Um, good context. And so, through those experiences, not only being black in those spaces, but also being gay in those spaces, right? Um, and not feeling like we had the support, not feeling like we had the community. Um, we didn't want other people to have to go through that. Um, so we started Leadership Brainery as a way to build community with young leaders who do want to continue to advance their education. Um, as we were talking with the institutions, they kept saying, well, we can't find um, qualified, diverse candidates. We hear it all the time, um, and we know that's not true so many talented, diverse, LGBT um, candidates out there, um, but it's more so about them feeling like they are um, empowered enough to go into these spaces and thrive in these spaces. And so that's why we created the Leadership Brainer to continue to foster that, but then also to work with the institutions um, to make sure that they are more equitable, make sure they are more accepting and they're looking beyond just the traditional test scores and um, personal statements, but what does um, someone who identifies as LGBT, a person of color, and have all these different intersections, how do they benefit um, the perspective of the classroom? If I'm sitting in the law school classroom, I'm sitting in the medical school classroom, and you don't have LGBT representation, all we're doing is putting out irresponsible practitioners that's going to continue to perpetuate the injustices. Um, so how do we work with the institutions um, to ensure that they are taking that approach and changing the way they recruit, changing the way that they teach in their curriculum. Um, and so, so yeah, that's how Leadership Brainer came about and kind of how we work with the students and um, the institutions. And I also say that the connection of postgraduate education to then the workforce, the fact that when we look at mid-level and senior level roles, um, decision making and leadership roles across industries, um, from law to medicine and tech, finance, and so forth, um, that there is a huge underrepresentation of not only people of color, um, but also LGBT individuals um, who are in those leadership roles at the table making decisions and who have access to even higher wage careers, income, 
um, that can only that can also stabilize their families and allow them to reinvest in their communities. And so leadership brainery's theory of change is that with greater access to inclusive networks and resources and advanced education that BIPOC and first generation um, communities um, can access higher wages to be able to stabilize their families and reinvest in our communities as a way to close wealth gaps and opportunity gaps. Um, this is how we can move the needle. This is one way, one solution um, via the work that we're doing at LB through postgraduate education um, to open up the door um, to greater access and opportunity for sure for our communities. And we know that if we get more LGBT students into competitive postgraduate schools and then they go into these corporations or organizations and can't have mid-level, senior-level roles, they have the influence to pour back and represent the communities that they come from. Um, and so how can we continue to ensure that we have leaders who look like us, who have been through our experience? And that's what we're doing at least. I can see the love is, is on a mission of addressing very specific issues. I want to talk about what is it like to live together and to work together? And how does that impact the work relationship and the home relationship? How, how do you switch from co-worker to partner at home? Well, I'll first say that we've always worked together. So I think that's a dynamic that kind of formed uh, our relationship from the very beginning. So we've always known how to work together. Perhaps it was learning how to really separate that to your point um, to figure out how do we also nurture kind of our private and personal relationship, which you know I, I really think we we have when I say God sent brought us together. I really do believe that um, we've been able to really kind of organically navigate um, the ins and outs of a work life and our personal life. But it does call um, require that we be very intentional about taking time to spend with each other, um, to appreciate each other, um, which can be very challenging because when we leave the office, we go home and still talk about leadership brainery. We're still doing business. We're still responding to emails. We're still strategizing. We have two whiteboards at the house that we, that we use. Like we are still working even beyond um, the office. And it can be very challenging um, to, to balance that because then you feel like you're never off the clock. You're never taking the time for each other. And so in the recent years, we've tried to be just a bit more intentional about saying, let's pause and let's have us some us time. Let's watch some Netflix and chill. Um, and so I think we're doing more of that. Yeah, we're definitely doing more of that. You know, I would say uh, most folks, when you talk about work, um, yeah, I'm not going to say most, but a lot of folks are not doing hard work. You know, mm -hmm. this is what we love to do. This is our passion. It's what gets us going. And so um, it's not necessarily that we need to separate, you know, what we love. That's what makes us who we are. Um, that's what attracted us. We were helping people. We were running for positions to make impact on our campus. Um, so it's just a part of who we are. And so, um, like Jonathan said, I think over the last few years, just with growth and maturity of not working 24-7, you know, we have been able to prioritize um, our, our mental health, mm -hmm. our self-care. Um, now, I mean, I can't even stay up past 10 o'clock. I'm tired. <laughs> uh, and so having an office space, being able to go home and just kind of detach um, is definitely helpful. Mm -hmm. um, but when we were in startup phase with Leadership Brainery and we were working from our home, it is hard. It was much more harder to turn it off. Mm -hmm. So um, we're at a much better place now. Yes. Yeah. And, uh, how important it is to create time, but you must have had a lot of time together recently during quarantine. So quarantining together, something marvelous happened. You guys got married. Yes, yes we, did. we did. How Finally. did that happen? Did, was something during quarantine happen or was there a plan to always have it this year? Or what clicked to make it happen in quarantine during that time? I think quarantine, one, we definitely did spend a lot of time together, but beyond that, um, it was a, a convenient way of not having to think about everybody else, I would say. We got a chance to get married, just me and him, and our pastor, Brandon Crowley, 
who came and officiated. We did it in the Arboretum exactly where we got engaged. And, and to have that special private time with us, not having to worry about buying food for everybody for the reception, not having to deal with flying a whole bunch of people in and housing them and sending invitations, which was one of the biggest challenges for us in terms of we got engaged in 2017. And so it wasn't until 2020 that we got married. And part of that delay um, was just the new, the, logist, the logistics, the nuances of planning a wedding and all of that. And we just didn't have the time or capacity um, to do that um, as we thought we did. Uh, learned a lot about how expensive weddings um, are. And so the pandemic made it more convenient for us. Yeah. 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 You know, and I would say, as Jonathan said, we were just going through a lot at the engagement piece when it first started. I mean, mm -hmm. Jonathan was still in law school and leadership branding was first take was just starting to take off. And so it was just a lot and we got really distracted. Um, and everybody, when you talk about weddings, are in it for themselves. You know, they want the experience. Um, and so it was mm -hmm. really great to just have an intimate experience to just express our love to each other. In COVID, I learned much more how to um, communicate better um, with Jonathan. I think that has been one of the strongest pieces in our relationship. When we were at three years, when we were at um, our five-year mark, um, and our eight-year mark, um, we went through experiences where we're just like, let's hone in on our communication. Um, and this was another one of those moments of how do we best communicate with each other, know what each other um, it's filling without necessarily having to share that. And when you're literally sitting in the house in quarantine um, and we just stare at each other all day, we only have a one bedroom apartment. Uh, you know, you can learn a lot about um, communication styles, nonverbal communication styles. And so I would say I learned a lot around that. Yeah. And I'll say that I really learned, and it, I guess it, really, it became more clear to me that I'm not bored with him. I'm not bored with him. So to be literally pinned up in a house with someone and not being able to go out and connect with other people, um, to, to have it be reassured and reaffirmed, like, hey, this person keeps me alive and I can be in quarantine with this person for the rest of my life. Your work and so many other people that, that I've met, whether it's Michael or Derek or Jonathan, I know that there's a young person somewhere watching them and thinking, oh, I can do this because of them, right? And you've taught in school before, so, so you've had some interaction with children. And you, what is your hope for the LGBT youth? What is it that you hope they would understand or that they would know? I think I would want them to know like, that they are worthy as like just as they are you're good you know like i think for me one of the things i remember telling my mom after i'd come out i was like if i can help somebody not feel this pain not feel mm -hmm. like i'm feeling now even if it's just one person I live in this place of of joy all the time black joy gay joy um, art joy and so i think my message i have two messages to um to the young people one is to to take care of yourself it's really important that you take care of yourself. A lot of things will be more easily managed if you have a really strong self-care practice. And the second thing I would say is that you are essential to this world and you're the leaders of this world in just a few years. And so we need to hear from you. We need to hear your thoughts about how things are going. We need to hear your thoughts about what you want the world to be because it's gonna be your job to, 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 to run it. And we try to fix all the problems. And some, some people may say we made some of the things worse. Um, and so we're handing it off to you and we're gonna need your help in fixing it. Yeah, so I would hope for um, our young LGBTQ folks to know that they are special mm -hmm. um, in a good way. You know, I think for so long society has made us um, the bad person, the outsider. Um, and as we start to get representation and we normalize that um, your sexuality does not dictate who you are as an individual, um, be empowered by that. 
Um, of course, it's scary to come out and be yourself, um, and you will never get um, the affirmation from everybody, no matter what you do. Um, and that's for women, for LGBT, um, it's just impossible for everyone to like you. Um, but then at the same time, it's possible for us to change the mindsets of a lot of people. And the only way we do that is if we be ourselves. Um, and so Leadership Brainery, I, I do feel like us becoming a, a larger voice, being able to get this stage where we can highlight um, our LGBT um, talent, where we can um, have a bigger platform for ourselves so folks can see you can start nonprofits to even help um, many more people live out their dreams and successes. Um, I'm really excited about that and I'm excited about um, us continuing to ensure that we are giving um, LGBT folks opportunities through our organization, um, through our staff, through our board. We, are always um, ensuring that we have their representation. And, and making sure that those with their backs against the wall, you know, are uplifted, um, are visible, honing in and focusing on our trans community um, is super important. Um, we consider those to be the ones with their backs most against the wall that we need to be um, standing with, that we need to be speaking up for and with making space um, for for them to speak up and express themselves, uh, make decisions that are going to make it a more equitable and just and loving society for us all to live and thrive in. Um, we're pushing ourselves as um, to what we would consider passing cisgendered um, men to to think about those who we don't necessarily walk in their same shoes um, to make sure that we're understanding more and more of their experience and championing and advocating on their behalf as well. We have waited too long to take back what is ours. We have to think back to Marsha P. Pay it no mind Johnson, Sylvia Rivera, the people who put their lives on a line so I can do the work that I'm doing today and so that we can be here in community today. When you look around you right now, this is what community looks like. This is what diversity looks like. The opposite of Boston Pride. They didn't want to give us a seat at the table, so we created our own table. And that, that is going to continue when it comes to employment and to housing and to making sure that our community has the tools and resources needed to be sustainable. We are going to break this cycle of oppression that has been placed on us. And every year as June comes around, we have all these companies, organizations trying to reach out to us um, to pay us $75 for a panel. Where are you in November? Where are you in December when trans people who are homeless on the streets are searching for shelter, searching for clothing, searching for nutrition? Where are you then? And I think it's up to us as community to hold these politicians, these companies, these organizations accountable for what they say and what they say they're claim they're gonna do. Because if they don't, we're gonna be in that ass. There's no reason why in New England, this is the only program that there is assisting homeless and low income trans folks with nutrition assistance, personal supplies, rental assistance, homelessness prevention. And this is from the community, you all did this. Last year, we were able to raise over $100,000. We were able to assist 50, 50 transgender and gender non-conforming individuals with rental assistance, over 130 individuals with nutrition assistance, personal supplies. And all of these, these funds come from the community. So this is a community need. We need mutual aid. We need everybody to step up to the table because just because that orange clown is out of the White House, we still have many people across this country that are trying to take our rights away. Yeah.
We get so hooked up in Massachusetts and thinking about the rights that we have here. But our trans brothers and sisters and non-binary in the Carolinas and in Alabama, they don't have the rights that we have here. So we got to fight twice as harder to make sure they can get the same resources that we have. A lot of us are kicked out of our homes, 14, 15, 16, just for being who we are. So we miss a lot of life lessons. Mm. How to balance a checkbook? How should I show up when I'm searching for employment? It is up to us as community members to teach each other these tools so we can be sustainable. You are the future. You are the next police officers, lawyers, politicians. I know in this crowd, the next Ayanna Presley is here. She's here. And so we need to start doing the work. I know this June comes around, a lot of people come out, but we need to know what are you gonna do all year round to make your impact heard and known.